My stepdad is one of the most stingy people in the world. I'm sure you'll agree with me once I tell you some of our house rules. When we use the bathroom at night, we're not allowed to turn on the light. My stepdad says, you already know where you're going to do it. Why do you have to see it? We can throw out a tea bag only after it's been used three times. In the winter, we can't turn on the heater until the temperature outside drops down to 15 degrees. We have to wear jackets, scarves, and hats inside the house. On the first day of each month, my stepdad gives us a roll of toilet paper each. That's all the toilet paper we can use until the end of the month. My mom married him six years ago. That's how long we've had to tolerate this guy's stinginess. My real dad left us. My mom used to be a housewife. When they got divorced, she started working at a dry cleaners. We had almost no money left after paying our rent. We were barely getting by. My stepdad Hugh was my mom's boss. His wife had cancer for a long time. When she passed, Hugh was left alone with his young daughter. Because he needed someone to look after his daughter, he asked my mom to marry him. When my mom told me this, I was totally against it, but she wouldn't listen to me. If I don't marry Hugh, we won't have any money. This marriage can save us. Maybe you'll get to be able to go to college, she said. She was aware that Hugh was a frugal man, but like me, she only figured out how cheap he was when we all started living together. After the wedding, my stepdad took us out for dinner to celebrate. We didn't know him very well yet. When we came home afterwards, he took pockets of salt and sugar and a bunch of tissues out of his pocket. They all had the restaurant's logo on them. When he realized we were staring at him, he said, we could have used these at the restaurant, but we didn't, so they're ours. I took them so we could use them at home. From then on, my stepdad took us out to dinner only on his daughter's birthday. And when he did, it was only to a fast food place. Once we were at a burger spot, and when he saw that it was a little pricier than expected, he only got us french fries. Another time, when we went to a fried chicken place, after we ate, he asked for a to-go bag for the bones. The next evening at dinner, he put those bones on the table. You left so much meat on those bones. You didn't do a good job scraping them off. Come on, let's clean these, he said, and started working on them. That night, no one else touched those bones. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Thanks so much. In my senior year of high school, my stepdad said, what are your plans for the future? You know you need to move out when you turn 18, right? I couldn't believe my ears. When I said, no, sir, I didn't know that. He replied, now you know. This is your final year of freeloading. Soon you'll have to fend for yourself. My mom was not having it. She said, Matt will go to college. If money's the issue, he can help us out at the dry cleaner, to which my stepdad shot back with, of course money's the issue. What else? In that case, he should start working with us right now. If he's any good, maybe I'll give him a chance to stay here next year. The next day, I went to the dry cleaners. My mom said it would be best if I started working at the front counter. She said that men usually brought their business suits and women brought their evening dresses. All I had to do was take their clothes. It was an easy gig, but the downside was that I had to work next to my stepdad. He was sitting at the register and taking the money. I started going to work after school. After working with my stepdad for a while, I came to understand how deep his money worship went. Whenever a wealthy looking man brought in a business suit, he would get a twinkle in his eye. After the customer would leave, he'd say, check the pockets. Let's see if he's left anything in there. Some people did indeed leave money in their pockets. Then my stepdad would be as happy as a kid. Easy money, I love it, he would say. As he put the money in the register to defend himself, he'd say, if you saw money on the street, would you pick it up or keep walking? Of course you would take it. This is no different. If the person who brought in a suit was middle class, he'd look down on them and say, these losers either have dirty tissues or lottery tickets in their pockets. They spend their lives dreaming. Unfortunately, he'd be right. We would never find any money in their pockets. Once we found a Powerball ticket in a jacket, I was annoyed that my stepdad was right again. In the other pocket, there was a piece of paper. When I opened it, I saw that it was a hospital bill. It was for a lot of money. I remembered the guy who dropped off the suit. It was obvious that he didn't have a lot of money. I felt sad for him and thought, maybe the lottery ticket was his last hope. The next day, when the guy showed up to take his suit back, I said to him, I found these in your pocket and gave him back the lottery ticket and hospital bill. My daughter is in the hospital. I wore that jacket the last time to visit her. I was really distracted that day. I forgot to check my pockets, he said. No problem, I hope your daughter feels better soon, I replied. My stepdad overheard the conversation. That night at home, he said to my mom, this kid is really naive. 
I tell him anything that comes out of those pockets is ours. He's still going around giving customers back the things we find. When my mom said, Matt did the right thing, my stepdad got mad. In that case, when the time comes, you will also leave this house along with your son. I regret spending my money on both of you, he said. My mom got really upset. She started crying. I couldn't sleep that night. I didn't have to put up with my stepdad. I promised myself I'd leave home the first chance I got and take my mom with me. A week passed. I came to the dry cleaners after school, as always. When I walked in, my stepdad said, This gentleman has been waiting for you for a while. He says he has a present for you. It was the customer with the daughter in the hospital. He said with a smile, Well, young man, I'm about to give you a present, and you certainly deserve it. Would you please come outside with me? My stepdad was trying to understand what was going on. He followed us outside. The man made a phone call. Shortly after, one of those armored vehicles used by banks to transfer money showed up. Two armed guards got out. They opened the barn doors of the vehicle. Both my stepdad and I were shocked. It was stacked full of money. I was even more shocked when our customer pointed to the money and said, Young man, half of this is yours. W what Am I being pranked? I barely muttered. The guy whose name I later learned was Keith put his hand on my shoulder. No, I'm serious, he said, and started explaining. Remember that Powerball ticket you returned to me? I hit the jackpot with it. There's $84 million in this vehicle right now. $42 million of it is yours. You could have chosen to not give me back the ticket, but you did. You deserve this money because you're an honest person. Now let's go to the bank and deposit this money. My stepdad was shaking with excitement. I'm Matt's stepdad. This money is practically mine. He's not even 18 yet. He can't have his own bank account. You have to deposit the money into mine, he said. I'll be 18 in four months. Didn't you tell me I was supposed to move out when I turned 18? My stepdad pretended it was all a big misunderstanding. Son, you must have gotten me wrong. I love you very much. I was only kidding. Of course you're welcome to stay as long as you want. It's your home, he said, trying really hard to convince me. Obviously, I knew that wasn't true. I don't think you love me at all. The only thing you love is money, I replied. Keith took my side and said, I will give the money to Matt when he turns 18. Please leave him alone. Then he turned to me and said, Matt, will you come to the bank with me? Soon you'll have half of this money anyway. My stepdad turned red with fury, but there was absolutely nothing he could do. We went to the bank and then to the hospital. Keith's daughter had a rare and very serious disease. She had been in the hospital for a long time. Keith had to sell their house and his car to be able to pay her hospital bills. Even that wasn't enough. So he was selling everything he could, including his clothes. That's why he brought in the suit to the dry cleaners in the first place. He wanted to get it clean so he could sell it. Thankfully, winning the lottery solved his money problems. And he could now afford to care for his daughter. It's been only a month since it happened. Keith bought a new house. A mansion, in fact. My mom and I moved in with him. We'll be buying our own house soon, but... First, we're waiting to find out which college I'll be attending. If I go to college in another city, maybe we can buy our house there. By the way, my stepsister Daphne is living with us. Her dad, that is, my ex-stepdad, didn't mind her coming with us. He comes to visit her sometimes. Daphne is happier with you, he says. But I think that's not the real reason why he let her come with us. He's happy to have someone else take care of his daughter. This way, he can keep his money all to himself. Last month, I made the easiest $500 of my life. There was a film crew staying at my dad's hotel. They shot a few scenes in the hotel restaurant. I was watching them work with a few of the waiters. They were trying to shoot this fight scene, but there was a problem. The leading actor was inexperienced and didn't know how to punch the other guy without hurting him. The director was showing him how to fake a punch, but the guy just couldn't get it right. He kept on throwing real punches. The other actor was getting really angry. After the 10th take, one of the waiters pointed to me and said, Actually, if you get the boss's son to play him, your problem will be solved. When the director asked, What's so special about him? The waiter replied, You'll see it if you try him out. The director decided to go ahead and shoot the scene with me. The lead actor kept doing the same thing. He was punching me really hard. But for me, that wasn't a problem at all. You know why? Because I don't feel pain. The guy could have been punching me the whole day and I wouldn't feel a thing. After the shoot, the director thanked me a million times and paid my actor's fee of $500.
So how come all those punches didn't hurt me? Am I a superhero? Of course not. I have a genetic disorder. It's a kind of disease. It's called CIP, which is short for congenital insensitivity to pain. People call it the not feeling pain disorder. There are about 400 people in the world who have this condition. I'm one of them. I never feel physical pain or aches. Let's say you accidentally hit your thumb as you're hammering a nail. What would happen? Obviously, it would hurt a ton. But when I do that, I feel nothing because my brain doesn't know what pain is. And since it doesn't know what it is, it can't send the pain signal to my thumb. I don't feel pain, but that doesn't mean that my body doesn't get hurt. Once, I stepped on a toy car that my baby brother left lying around. It sent me flying six feet into the air, and I landed on the floor really hard. I didn't feel any pain, but I was unable to stand up afterwards. My dad took me to the hospital. X-rays revealed that I had multiple fractures in both legs. I had to stay in bed for three months with huge casts. You might imagine that it would be really nice to never feel pain, but don't be jealous of me. This is definitely not a good thing. It's super dangerous to live without pain. Let me give you a few examples. Say you're at a restaurant. The waiter brings you a delicious pizza. You immediately take a huge bite, but the pizza is too hot because it just came out of the oven. What do you do? You wait until it cools down a little. If you don't, you'll burn your mouth. And that's exactly my problem. No matter how hot the pizza is, my mouth doesn't hurt. I keep eating the scalding hot pizza. Inevitably, I get deep burns inside my mouth. However, I don't feel any of them. I still end up hurting myself. I mean, my body. As you can see, pain is actually our guardian angel. It keeps us from hurting ourselves. Pain is also our teacher. It teaches us how to go about doing physical activities without hurting our bodies. And it starts teaching us when we're children. I'll give you another example. You're riding your bike at the playground. You don't realize you're going too fast. You hit something and fall off the bike. You start crying because you hurt yourself. This feels bad in the moment, but the next day, you're so much more careful on the bike. And who did you learn that from? Pain, of course. You learned how to ride a bike without hurting yourself thanks to the pain you felt. Because there was no concept of pain in my life, I had a pretty dangerous childhood. When I was a baby, my family had no idea I had this condition. Since I never cried, my mom was telling her friends, John is such a calm baby. He doesn't cry even when he falls. One day, my mom took me to the playground. I climbed up the slide. A kid pushed me from behind and I fell and landed on my head. My mom ran to me in a panic. She screamed, John, are you okay? But I laughed and said, mom, falling is way more fun than sliding down. Can I climb up and jump down again? My mom was obviously confused. She took me to the hospital and found out that my arm was broken in two places. When the doctors saw that I wasn't hurting despite the fractures, they thought that wasn't normal and ran a series of tests on me. Finally, they figured out that I had this insensitivity to pain. The year I started elementary school, I had to change schools because of my condition. My mom came to the school and told my teacher that I had CIP. If John falls down and breaks something, he wouldn't know it. Please keep an eye on him. My teacher thought it would be better if my friends knew about this as well. Everyone was really surprised when they learned that I didn't feel any pain. Word spread around the whole school really quickly. During recess, I went outside. Older kids came up to me. They started pinching my nose and twisting my ears to test me. Well, it didn't hurt, but I was still uncomfortable. But they wouldn't stop. I had to change schools after that. We didn't make the same mistake twice. At my new school, we didn't tell anyone about my condition, not even the teachers. Before I continue with my story, let me ask you for a quick favor. If you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Thanks so much. So far, I've told you only about the disadvantages of having this condition. Are there good sides to it? Of course, I never get headaches. If someone steps on my foot in the crowd, it doesn't hurt. Even if I work out for hours, I have zero muscle pain the next day. Once, when I was in junior high, we took a field trip to a farm. One of the staff members was giving us a tour of the place. When we came to the beehives, he wanted to show us a honeycomb full of honey. But as he was taking the honeycomb out of the hive, he dropped it and the bees got really mad. Suddenly, hundreds of bees attacked us. Kids started running away, but the bees stung everyone anyway. The farm suddenly looked like a battlefield. 
Dozens of kids were lying on the floor and crying. I was the only one who remained calm. I got stung too, but it didn't hurt me. My friends were really surprised. I lied to them and said, for some reason, I didn't get stung. In fact, I got stung in multiple places because I didn't bother running away like everyone else. I benefited from having CIP once again last year. I was playing frisbee in the park with a girl I have a crush on. A pit bull ran up to me from behind and bit me on my butt. If I had been a normal person, I would have been holding my butt, screaming at the top of my lungs and embarrassing myself in front of this girl. But when the dog bit, I felt nothing. When the pit bull sped off and disappeared, the girl ran up to me and asked, Are you okay? That was a really bad bite. I was so cool when I answered her. No, that was nothing. Just a nip. It was obviously a serious bite that would have hurt anyone else. My crush was so impressed with me that day. I just remembered another example. I had an issue with my pancreas. Doctor said I had to have an emergency surgery. I had it scheduled for the next morning. The doctor in charge knew that I had CIP. We won't give you anesthesia since you won't be feeling pain anyway, he said. But the anesthesiologist had no idea about this decision. She put the anesthesia mask on my face before I could say anything and put me to sleep. But for some reason, I woke up in the middle of the surgery. My belly was cut open. I looked like a total zombie. When I made eye contact with the anesthesiologist, I smiled and said hello. She screamed so loud that I can't even begin to describe it. She had a right to be scared because I'd woken up during surgery and I was all smiles, no pain. When my doctor told her I had CIP, she calmed down and had a good laugh about it. After that, I got to watch the rest of the surgery. I might be the first and only person in medical history to witness surgery being performed on them. As I was going to the hospital for follow-up exams, I met a woman who had the same condition as me. According to her, having CIP has two important benefits for women. One, they don't feel menstrual pain. This is a great thing because, as you know, women have to deal with menstrual pain every month. Another advantage women with CIP have is that they give birth without feeling any pain. According to some experts, labor pain is the most intense in the world. Therefore, women with pain insensitivity are really lucky in that way. So what causes this condition? Who has it? Unfortunately, there are no answers to these questions yet. But scientists agree that it's a genetic disorder. They even identified the gene that causes it. But since very few people in the world have this condition, pharmaceutical companies don't spend money to develop drugs for it. So there's no cure for this disorder. I have to live with this condition all my life. Many people with CIP don't live very long. As I said earlier, aches and pains are our guardian angels. It's really dangerous to live without them. You are so lucky to feel them. This is my best friend, Aid. We both started school at the beginning of the term. Neither of us had any friends because we were both new. At first, we sort of felt like we had to stick together. But when we realized that we were getting along well, our obligatory friendship became real. One night, I heard a sound while getting ready for bed. At first, I didn't know what it was. When I heard another clank, I realized it was coming from the window. When I opened it, I looked down and saw Aid. Aid loves surprises, so I thought this was one of his funny games. I opened the window wide and said with a laugh, Hey, you realize I'm not Rapunzel, right? I don't have long hair I can let down, so there's no way you can climb up to my castle. But I was shocked to hear the panic in Aid's voice. Bro, open the door, please hurry! I need to come in now! I went downstairs to let him in. He was panting, so I figured he'd been running for a while. Was he running away from someone? Aid is my best friend, but I have to admit that there's something odd about him. For example, he comes to our place all the time, but he's never invited me to his house. Not even once. I didn't even know where in the city he lived. Once I asked him what his father did for a living. He didn't answer. I thought he didn't hear me, so I repeated my question. He just stared at me absentmindedly. Which is faster, Flash or Superman? Who would beat who, he asked. It was a weird change of subject, but I answered, Definitely Flash. Obviously, he didn't want to talk about his parents, so I didn't push him. I gave Aid a glass of water and led him up to my room. He held the side of his belly. I've been running for an hour. I'm exhausted. I almost collapsed to the ground, he said as he sat down. I was so worried I forgot to answer. Aid snapped me to attention. Are you going to ask me why I was running? Would you even tell me if I did? I asked. He laughed. I realize I can be mysterious sometimes, but I'm not that closed off. Of course I will. I was running from some people. 
I asked him, from who? He looked at me dead in the eyes and said, let's say from now on until the end of your life, you can only eat one food. What food would that be? Pick one. He got me again. I shouldn't have asked. I knew you were going to hit me with your weird questions. I laughed as I fake punched his shoulder. Aid laughed back and removed his phone from his backpack. Forgot it's dead, he groaned. That's why I couldn't tell you I was coming. You got a charger? We talked about everything and nothing the rest of the night, just like we always did, laughing so hard at each other's jokes it hurt. Can I stay over? Aid asked. You know you don't have to ask, I replied. When I woke up the following day, he was gone, but he'd left his phone behind, along with a note. Forgive me, Lucas. I need to act mysterious for a little longer, but I promise to tell you everything. Hold on to my backpack for a bit. You can give them my phone, but please don't let anyone touch the bag. I didn't get it. Why would Aid leave his stuff with me? Plus, who would want his phone? What was he hiding in the bag? You have no right to keep me in the dark like this. I was so annoyed I couldn't help but speak my thoughts as if Aid was right there in front of me. I took the backpack and unzipped it, too curious to stop myself. I needed to know. When I opened the main pocket, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was chock full of money. I'd never seen this much in my entire life. How could Aid have possibly found all this money? Was my best friend a thief? I opened another pocket filled with more bills, but they weren't dollars. I held one up to get a closer look. The second I saw the picture on the strange currency, I blinked in confusion. Aid's face, yes, my best friend Aid, had his face printed on money from another country. The name of the currency and the country it belonged to were printed next to his likeness. Shavaku, Nora. I could gather that Shavaku was the country's name and Nora was its currency, but I'd never heard of either of them before. I quickly opened Google to run a search, but I was quickly interrupted. My dad opened my bedroom door with a concerned look on his face. Lucas, there are people at the door who want to see you. Who, I asked. You should come downstairs. It's important you see for yourself, he replied. My dad was right. I was shocked to see who my visitors were. It had been only five minutes since I'd seen my best friend's face on a bill. Now a group of foreign dignitaries and federal agents was questioning me. I went back to my room and sat on my bed, confused about all that was happening. There was a vital decision I needed to make. Think, Lucas, think, I muttered to myself. How was I to know what was right and wrong in this situation? Then I remembered my search on Shavaku. Immediately, I picked up my phone to go online, but it started ringing. I didn't recognize the number. It had been such a crazy morning that I was scared to answer, but I accepted the call and waited for the voice on the other line. Did they come? I was relieved to hear Aid speaking. Yes, they did, I said excitedly. Do they have my phone? Yes, I answered. Good, he said. I knew they were going to track the signal and come pay us a visit. I bought myself some time by removing the SIM card so I could disappear. I put the SIM back in just before I left. I'm sorry I dragged you and your family into this. His voice weighed with sadness. An apology from the mighty king of Shivaku. How the tables have turned, I joked. Bro, you're my best friend, Aid chuckled. I was going to tell you everything. I was just waiting for the right time, that's all. Before I could say anything, he added, Can you do me one more favor? I need the money in the bag. I can't escape without it. Bring the bag to the bowling alley tonight. We'll be safest in a public place. Yes, your majesty, I said in a fake accent. I didn't care if aid was royalty. I still had to tease him a bit. After I hung up, I opened the backpack again. I kept one of the Nora bills with Aid's picture as proof that I was friends with the Prince of Shivaku. Who knows? Maybe I'll tell my grandkids. I noticed a paper scroll between the dollars as I zipped up the bag. I unrolled it to take a look. It was the deed for a diamond mine. There was no doubt in my mind Aid was royalty now. I rushed to the bowling alley. Aid flashed me a shy smile when he saw me. I could tell he was feeling guilty. As I returned his bag, I had to ask, I know now why you left your phone, but I don't get why you didn't want to take the bag with you. Aid said, I'm kind of proud I shook off the agents who were chasing me that night, but it would have caused problems if they had caught me with all that money. I figured I could trust you with it. When he put on the backpack, I realized it was time for him to go, but there was one more thing I needed to do before he left. Please don't be upset with me. I'm doing this for your own good. I said, putting both of my hands up in the air. 
That was the signal. Suddenly, a group of agents formed a circle around us. Age's jaw dropped as he struggled to process what was going on. And just like that, Aid's mother, the queen, appeared. Earlier in the day, she had visited our house. She was wearing her native garb, which looked incredibly glamorous. The queen opened her arms wide. My dear son, I've missed you so much, she said. Aid looked at her with anger in his eyes, but the anger slowly faded as she approached. He ran to his mother and embraced her. He must have missed her a lot. How's father doing? He asked. He's still receiving treatment, she replied. The doctors say he can't travel. Say goodbye to your friend. Your father needs us. Our plane awaits. Stopping Aid from escaping filled me with dread. What if he was mad at me? Aid turned to me. Thanks for doing this for me. I don't think I could have run for the rest of my life. And more importantly, my country and my father need me. <laughs> he gave me a huge hug and said, My birthday is next month. You're invited. I'll send a private jet to pick you and your family up. I was so relieved Aid wasn't <laughs> mad at me. Of course, your majesty. Your wish is my command, I laughed. <laughs> I'm sure you're curious about why Aid had escaped in the first place. You remember how my dad had walked into my room telling me we had guests just as I was about to Google Shivaku, right? Aid's mother and Shivaku's prime minister had come to visit us. The queen told me everything huh? after introducing herself. Shivaku was a small African country, rich in diamond mines. Aid's father, the king, had suffered a heart attack. Traditionally, Aid would have become king after graduating college. But when his dad got sick, he was forced to take the throne earlier than planned. Aid didn't enjoy being king. He was bored in meetings all day. He had to deal with every issue in the country one by one. Finally, he'd had enough. One night, he fled to the U.S. and enrolled in public school. When the queen and the prime minister found out that the king was missing, they searched the entire globe for him. In the U.S., they worked closely with the FBI. The queen asked me to help them after telling me everything. That's why it was so hard to make a decision. Should I help the queen and Shivaku, or should I keep Aid's secrets? After thinking it over, I knew that Aid would make a great king with enough time. When my family finally visited him for his birthday, I could see Aid was a real king. He lived in a gigantic palace with a magnificent throne and a crown to match. His birthday celebration was legendary. There were parties every night for an entire week with constant fireworks in the sky every night. I was so proud of my friend when I saw how much his people loved him. As Aid and I walked around the capital city of Shivaku, everyone who saw the young king bowed and wished him a happy birthday. It's incredible to have a king as a best friend, but I think it's priceless for your best friend to be a king who's loved so much by his people.